On May 14, 1796, English physician Edward Jenner, who had realized that milkmaids were strangely immune to the illness smallpox, deliberately infected an eight-year-old boy named James Phipps with the illness cowpox. Cowpox was a virus that was common in cattle and often passed to the people who work with cattle. It was Jenner's hope that by infecting Phipps with the mild illness cowpox, he would protect him from the deadly illness smallpox. Jenner turned out to be correct, and his inspiration would go on to save millions of lives. It's considered a seminal moment in medical history, the first vaccination. But the thing is that at the time, Jenner had no idea what actually caused smallpox or cowpox. His vaccination came more than a century before the pathogen that caused the pox could be identified and described. The relatively new discovery of viruses deserves to be remembered. Both smallpox and cowpox were caused by viruses. But Jenner's vaccination came 96 years before the first virus was identified, 105 years before the first virus that could affect humans was identified, and a whopping 133 years before scientists could actually view the structure of a virus. The genome of the virus against which Jenner inoculated Phelps was not discovered until 1990. In fact, it was not until a century after Jenner infected James Phipps that the term virus was coined to describe the agent that caused smallpox. The fact that Jenner did not know how or why the vaccine worked made it difficult to extend the principle to other diseases. Since antiquity, physicians had realized that at least some illnesses were transmitted between people, although other illnesses they thought were transmitted by what they called bad air. But even to the extent that they understood that a disease could be transmitted from one person to another, they had very little understanding of the mechanism of that transmission. Ancient physicians, such as the second century Roman physician Galen, suggested the disease may be passed by what they called seeds, such as seeds of fever or seeds of plague that could pass through the air. In the 17th century, Dutch scientist Antony van Leeuwenhoek had perfected the microscope enough to actually see microorganisms and recognize that some of Galen's seeds were actually tiny living creatures. But the connection between the tiny living creatures that van Leeuwenhoek called animacules that he found, among other places, living in the plaque between his teeth, and illness was not immediately recognized. Perhaps the first person to make a connection between microorganisms and disease was Italian entomologist Agostino Bassi, who determined that a tiny organism, in this case a fungus, was responsible for a disease that was killing silkworms in silk farms in Italy. In 1835, he published his results, recommending the use of disinfectants, separating the rows of feeding caterpillars, and isolating and destroying infected caterpillars. His suggestions were credited with saving the industry. He further speculated that similar microorganisms may be responsible for diseases like cholera and leprosy. Still, scientists were reluctant to accept a theory that disease could be caused by tiny organisms. When Austrian physician Ignaz Semmelweis was able to demonstrate that washing hands and a solution of chlorinated lime significantly reduced the occurrence of puerperal fever in a maternity ward, he asserted that physicians were carrying cadaverous particles on their hands that were infecting patients. Despite the evidence that he had reduced infections, his work was largely disregarded and mocked, partly because he did not have a clear theory on what the cadaverous particles actually were. In 1854, English physician John Snow was able to track a cholera outbreak down to a specific water pump on Broad Street in London, thus disproving the miasma theory as the way that the disease spread. Snow argued that the disease was likely passed between people when some unknown pollution or morbid matter was passed out in one person's stool and passed to another when they drank water infected with the unknown pathogen. But other physicians at the time largely dismissed his theory. Sir John Simon, chief medical officer of, to Her Majesty's government, for example, called the idea peculiar. Snow's position was apparently correct. He removed the handle on the offending pump and the outbreak subsided, but his morbid matter idea was still not widely accepted by physicians. In the 1860s, French biologist Louis Pasteur determined that microorganisms caused the spoilage of beverages like beer, wine, and milk. He developed a process to heat the liquid to the point that it killed the microorganisms. The process became known, of course, as pasteurization. He surmised from his findings that microorganisms might also cause disease in humans, a conclusion that helped to spur British surgeon Joseph Lister to develop the use of antiseptic, in this case carbolic acid, for sanitary surgery. Eventually, his efforts to clean tools, wounds, and surgeons to prevent the introduction of bacteria into patients' wounds earned him the moniker the father of modern surgery. But like Semmelweis, his ideas were not immediately or readily accepted at the time. 
Pasteur did further research, isolating the bacteria that caused chicken cholera, an illness that could be devastating to flocks of domestic fowl. Not only was he able to identify the bacteria, but he was also able to demonstrate that inoculating chickens with bacteria that had spoiled would cause them to develop resistance without dying. He realized that the idea of using a weakened form of the disease causing pathogen to create immunity was what Jenner had done 80 years earlier. Pasteur, as an acknowledgement of Jenner, coined the term vaccines as the generic term for such artificially weakened diseases. Pasteur later utilized a similar method to create a vaccine to protect cattle and sheep from anthrax, and in 1885, in conjunction with his colleague Emile Roux, developed a vaccine for rabies, the first human vaccine to be developed since Jenner. But the rabies vaccine was different. Pasteur was unable to identify the microorganism that caused the disease. Rather than use the method he had with chicken cholera of isolating the bacteria and letting it spoil, he attenuated the disease by infecting rabbits and then drawing the affected nerve tissues. As the disease had specialized its form for humans, it was weaker in rabbits, thus providing a supply of weakened pathogens. Pasteur didn't know at the time that his difficulty in identifying the cause of the illness was because rabies and smallpox were caused by an entirely different kind of pathogen than chicken cholera and anthrax. Pasteur speculated that he was unable to find the cause because the pathogen was too small to be seen with a microscope, and in this he was correct, but he had no apparent idea how different the pathogen really was. German chemist Robert Koch was a contemporary and to some extent a rival of Pasteur. Koch developed the technique of pure culture, growing bacteria on a controlled laboratory medium. He pioneered the use of dyes to help make microorganisms easier to see under a microscope. Koch had initially isolated the anthrax bacteria and eventually did the same for tuberculosis and cholera. He attempted to create a vaccine for tuberculosis but was unsuccessful. Koch was instrumental in the development of the field of microbiology, but his largest impact might have been the development of Koch's postulates, a set of rules establishing microbial causality for a disease. The so-called four postulates were part of his process of obtaining pure cultures. The rules themselves were not specifically stated by Koch, but were first published by his assistant, Friedrich Loeffler, apparently based on the method used to isolate the bacteria that caused tuberculosis. The pathogen must be found in every case of the disease and must account for its clinical and pathological features. The pathogen cannot be found in other disease states as a non-pathogen. And after isolation from diseased tissues and repeated passage in pure culture, the pathogen can induce the same disease in animal models. Koch's four postulates spurred the rapid discovery of the bacterial etiology of many of the most important illnesses of the era and spurred a belief among scientists that a specific microorganism could be assigned to each infectious disease. A tool that proved particularly valuable in the process was the Chamberlain filter, created by Charles Chamberlain, a colleague of Pasteur. The Chamberlain filter is a type of ceramic water filter that filters out bacteria. The Chamberlain filter helped to determine that certain bacteria produce toxins that can still cause illness even after filtration. That then resulted in the development of antitoxins to treat tetanus and diphtheria. The development of an antitoxin for diphtheria by German physiologist Emil von Behring and his colleagues in the 1890s was described in the medical journal The Lancet as the most important advance of the 19th century in the medical treatment of acute infectious disease. But the Chamberlain filter would play another important role in the understanding of microbiology and disease. And that role had to do with the tobacco plant. Adolf Meyer was the grandson of a renowned German chemist and in 1862 earned a PhD in chemistry, physics, and mathematics. In 1879, while director of an agricultural experiment station in the Netherlands, he was asked to examine a disease that was affecting local tobacco plants. The disease causes reduced production and affects many plants in the nightshade family, including tomatoes and cucumbers. Because it causes a characteristic mottled pattern on the leaves, he called the disease tobacco mosaic disease. Meyer showed that the disease was transmitted by the sap from an infected plant, but was unable to find a fungi or bacteria in the sap and could not see any microorganism under a microscope. He used filtration that should have eliminated the bacteria, but found the sap still infected other plants. This was perplexing. Because he couldn't isolate a microbe, he could not meet the requirements of Koch's postulates to prove microbial causality for the disease. He suspected the toxin was something new. A colleague, Martinus Beierink, tried to repeat Meyer's findings and also found that the sap still infected other plants, even after filtration in a Chamberlain filter. Again, though, he was constrained by Koch's postulates. When he could not identify the microbes, he assumed it could only be 
an experiment error. In 1893, another researcher, 1300 miles away in Ukraine, named Dmitry Ivanovsky, was also studying the same disease in tobacco, and also concluded that the sap was still infectious after filtering. Again, he was constrained by the dogma of the day, the Koch postulates. He suspected his findings were either due to laboratory error or that there might be another material involved similar to the toxins that had been found in tetanus and diphtheria. The anomalous results prevented the scientists from fulfilling the requirements of Koch's postulates, and that led them to question their own findings. In 1898, Bayerink returned to the research and again determined that whatever was causing the disease was not filterable. But he made another discovery. Whatever the culprit was, it could not replicate on its own, like bacteria, but could replicate in a living plant. The agent only seemed to multiply in living cells that were dividing. He surmised this had to be something entirely new, and he coined the term virus, roughly ancient Greek for poison, to distinguish the find from bacteria. His assumption at the time was that the new agent must be some sort of liquid, and called it contagium vivium fluidum, Latin for contagious living fluid. In the end, viruses were proven not to be a liquid, but complex particles that were simply too small to be caught in the filters. The same year, Friedrich Loeffler found the hoof and mouth disease, an infection that affects cloven-footed animals, was also a virus by demonstrating that the blood of infected animals could still infect other animals even after being passed through a Chamberlain filter. With a greater understanding of viruses, several more were discovered in the first two decades of the 20th century, including bacteriophages, viruses that infect bacteria. One of the most common entities in the biosphere, they exist wherever bacteria exist. Phages have a number of medical applications and are a promising alternative to traditional antibiotics in treating drug-resistant strains. The field of virology was transformed by the invention of the electron microscope in 1931. While scientists knew that viruses existed, and some could be vaguely seen with an optical telescope, it was the electron microscope that allowed the actual structure of viruses to be seen and analyzed. Electron microscopes use a beam of accelerated electrons as a source of illumination. As the wavelength of an electron can be up to 100,000 times shorter than that of visible light photons, such microscopes have a much higher resolving power than optical light microscopes. In 1941, a virus was, for the first time, crystallized and photographed using X-ray diffraction, allowing a full understanding of its structure. That virus was, of course, the tobacco mosaic virus. The discovery of tobacco mosaic virus was critical to the entire field of virology. Not only was TMV the first virus to be actually discovered, but it was in studying TMV in 1936 that scientists discovered that the virus included the nucleic acid RNA, and that allowed scientists in 1956 to understand the process by which the virus infected a cell, a process called self-assembly between this RNA and a coat protein. The discovery of the tobacco mosaic virus began the field of virology. By the latter half of the 20th century, thousands of viruses had been identified, and for some that caused disease in humans, crops, or animals, treatments and vaccines had been developed. But the discovery and understanding of viruses was delayed nearly 20 years because of the scientific dogma of the day, Koch's postulates, which led scientists to discount their own anomalous findings. Ironically, Koch's postulates had been part of the process of breaking down the old dogma, miasma theory, and allowing the ascendance of germ theory. Koch's postulates had been critical to helping humans understand the connection between microorganisms and disease, but came to be so rigidly applied that they prevented the discovery of a completely different kind of microscopic pathogen. Scientists should have learned from the examples of John Snow and Ignaz Semmelweis that the best way to conduct science is to be willing to create brand new and then willingly throw away scientific dogma.